and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Welcome to the last in the series, and as usual we're going to mix things up a bit. As many of you viewers know, my magazine collection is fairly large, and in the rare moments that I get some peace and quiet, there's nothing I enjoy more than flicking through a few issues of ZX Computing or Crash. There is so much to catch up on, and yes, I do mean catch up. Things that I missed originally, are things that I wasn't interested in back then but am now, and seeing all the first time reviews of games that now have either become classics or faded into obscurity. It wasn't just games either, hardware held a particular fascination for me and still does today. As the original creator of the ZX Spectrum Hardware Index many years ago, that still forms the core of the hardware listed on many Spectrum websites, I catalogued a lot of equipment. The Spectrum, along with the ZX81 before it, had some truly innovative hardware, peripherals that expanded the machine beyond its limits and gave the user much more flexibility. It's a credit then to both Clive Sinclair for producing a machine with the expansion options and the companies who continue to push the little machine forward. There are big names of course, the Sinclair ZX Microdrive and Interface 1 providing not only fast storage but networking and a serial port. The Rotronics Wafer Drive, a competitor to the Microdrive that incorporated dual drives. The ZX Printer and Alphacom 32 Printer allowing us to print out tiny pieces of paper containing listings or letters. The numerous keyboards that gave us proper full travel experience the most popular being the DK-Tronics one. The Disciple and Plus D interfaces, allowing standard floppy drives to be used. Light guns, light pens, joystick interfaces, Interface 2, and many, many more. No doubt you'll have your own favourites, as I do. But what about the odd things, tucked away in the back of magazines, the ones that no one really bought? The Spectrum had some weird and wonderful peripherals. Let's start with a few ones you're possibly aware of. This is the RD Digital Tracer. It's not a drawing tool, it's a tracing tool. This plastic arm allowed you to trace pictures from paper. Not something you would rush out and buy, but it did what it claimed, albeit in low resolution. I reviewed this in episode 51, and although sturdily made, and having an interface made from a cassette box, it actually worked quite well if you had a steady hand. Joysticks and the Trick Stick, a handheld baseless rod that worked by picking up movement using small sensors on the handle. You did need two hands to use it though, so a bit of a problem if you needed to use the keyboard as well. Or you may know the Cheetah Rat, the infrared joystick controller. I reviewed this in episode 34. And how about this, the Logatron Sprite Board? Now this is one piece of kit I would love to get hold of. I'm not even sure if it was ever released, as the adverts say coming soon. Then there's the graph pad. Yes, the Spectrum had a graphics tablet. It must have been magical to draw on this and see what happened on screen. I suspect the limited resolution and colour usage of the machine hampered it a bit though. A teletext adapter, yes, using this device you could view pages of teletext, just like on your television. You did have to unplug the aerial from your TV first though, so if your TV already had it, there was no point in having one of these. A similar looking device, the VTX 5000 modem. For many people, myself included, this was their first venture into the realms of digital communication. You could log on to Prestel and Micronet 800, along with a host of other ViewData bulletin boards, with this wonderful piece of equipment. Later ROM updates and software allowed access to scrolling bulletin boards too. Numerous sound boxes were out there, the ZXON incorporated an AY chip, the fuller sound boxes, the DKtronics 3 channel sound unit, the Karar speech unit, the Datel Vox box, and many many more. All these wonderful devices allowed the Spectrum to go beyond its little beeper, and not to mention the numerous sound samplers out there that allowed you to take samples. Speech recognition was another thing. 
There was the micro command. I reviewed this in episode 61. And there was Big Ears from William Stewart Systems, both claiming to let you control your spectrum by just using your voice. Now onto some things you may not know. The Muckbus, a strange name for a strange piece of kit. Although for the user who wants everything, then this I suppose was the logical thing to come up with. It's a box that sits behind the spectrum and extends the expansion port, allowing multiple devices to be connected in a neat vertical way. There's also an optional power supply, so you could avoid frying your spectrum if you had a lot plugged into it. Although a logical idea, it doesn't address the problem of devices being incompatible. There were a lot of things planned for this device, including a disk interface, 80 column video output and a printer port. Along similar lines is the USB card extender, another idea that extends the expansion port. Not as nice looking or expandable as the MUC bus, but it does offer some similar functionality. I would be quite worried if I had that many boards hanging out of the back of my machine, and they do say that to use this you'd need to build your own power supply. Still on a similar subject, the Basic Air Expansion, another external expansion system. This takes a different approach though, and has each individual expansion part in its own case that stacks up on top of each other. This does look more professional, although the options are limited to memory expansions and a few other bits, like analogue to digital converters. As I was gathering images for this feature, I came across this, a microframe. It gives the user full control over 256 I.O. channels and also includes an onboard disk controller and operating system. Right, that's enough expansion systems then. Let's go on to something else, the red box system. Did you think that Alexa was the first device that you could control your household appliances with? Well, think again. The red box system was a multi-unit add-on that allowed anything electrical to be controlled by your spectrum. There was a separate box for each item you wanted to control, and using infrared receivers, you controlled them from the main box that plugged into your spectrum. This allowed you to do things like turn the lights on and off, turn the radios on and off, and televisions on and off. You know the kind of thing. It did require the spectrum to be running constantly though, and that meant of course you couldn't play games on it. And here's another weird one, the slow-mo. This little device connects to your spectrum and allows you to slow down and even stop your spectrum in its tracks. The idea was to allow you to play games slower before you tried them at normal speed, if you weren't very good at playing games. There was a different interface version of this too, called the pace setter. Not a bad idea I suppose, but I'm not sure if this unit had any detrimental effect on the spectrum itself. And finally we have a real oddity, the heart rate monitor. This little black box allowed you to monitor your heart rate, as it states, on your spectrum. This device can't have sold many units, and I have never seen one in the wild. That is, until someone contacted the show and asked if I would like to borrow one. I obviously jumped at the chance, and I never thought I'd get to see one of these things for real. Very kindly, Mike Cummins agreed to send the device to me so I could check it out, hopefully see if it worked, and of course review it for the show. To say I was excited is an understatement. The heart rate monitor was manufactured by Magenta Electronics and first appeared in magazines around mid to late 1983. It was advertised as something to aid health and fitness, and something that was safe, reliable and easy. Reading the advert, it looked amazingly like those fitness apps you can get on mobile phones, you know, the ones that read your heart rate, calculate steps and other stuff, but this was in 1983, and on a spectrum. The unit itself is unremarkable when you see it, Measuring 12 cm by 8 cm and being 3 cm deep, it has a single 3.5mm audio jack on one side, and that's about it. If you look very carefully, you can also see two small blobs on the top case. The version advertised is slightly different from the one I have. The advertised version clearly states it takes power from the spectrum with no batteries needed. The unit I have though requires a PP3 battery and does not connect to the expansion port. So either this is an early version or a later version. Either way, I can't wait to try this thing out. The first and most important question though is, would the software still work after 35 years? Many tapes get dropouts, some break, and some are just unreadable. And this was the make or break thing for me. Nervously, I placed the tape into a player, connected it to my PC, loaded up Audacity, and pressed play. It worked. 
I grabbed a full audio recording of both sides in decent quality, ready to be converted to TAP and TZX files. This was done quite easily, as all the programs had save routines built into them. I got both 16 and 48k versions of the programs recovered, and added to my DivMMC ready to be used. Next it was time to open up the unit and fit the battery, and this would give us a good look inside. Four screws on the back was all that held the unit together, and inside it was very clean. Now I'm no technical guru, so I have no idea what any of this stuff is. With the battery fitted, and the spectrum set up, it was time to see if this hardware had survived 35 years. Connecting the audio lead from the ear socket on the spectrum to the socket on the heart rate monitor produced some random bleeps, and this is to be expected according to the instructions, which meant the hardware seemed to be working. To load the software, the manual suggested you disconnect first though, and this I did, and carefully loaded it in. According to the manual, there are two programs. The first one gives you a digital readout of your heart rate. Except it didn't. The unit was beeping away, not always accurately, but at least it was beeping, and the software just wasn't picking it up. I tried different leads, nothing happened. I tried different fingers, and still nothing. I then tried a different spectrum, and finally it worked. Not sure why it didn't work on the first one, but never mind. Now I got a readout of my heart rate. To be honest, I'd been clambering around with lights and cameras, and was obviously nervous and excited, so this might be a bit high. And don't forget, this is a Spectrum and a 35-year-old piece of hardware. It was tricky getting your finger in the right position to get a steady reading. You had to adjust it left and right and different amounts of pressure, to, and then try and keep it still to get a good steady beep. The instructions claimed you could get good readings from your middle finger, thumb, cheek or even earlobe. Not sure I want to stick this on my ear though. Next I loaded the second program, an altogether more impressive piece of code, and something I had envisioned when I first saw the adverts. Setting an upper and lower limit, you then set the beats to count per reading, and the manual suggests three, and then the software proceeds to draw a graph of your heart rate over and over again. This is really impressive. Here's my little 48k specky, monitoring my heart rate. How cool is that? Again, any slight change in position of your finger will cause the reading to stray a little, or vanish, or shoot off the top. But overall, it does what it says. For you technophobes out there, and reading from the manual, it takes 50Hz readings and adjusts accordingly, giving you a 1 in 300 resolution which equates to an error rate of about 0.33%, if a good signal is obtained. The battery is claimed to last for 72 hours, and the unit is effectively switched off when the lead is disconnected. I did try to use this on an emulator, because Spectaculator allows you to connect a real audio source, but the timings were all over the place, as you can see. I can understand why this may have not sold well, Everyone knew that the serious software market and serious peripheral market was quite small, being dominated by word processors, sound or graphics programs. Take that to the next level with some hardware that only appeals to a tiny percentage of an already small market, and the sales must have been minimal. For one to survive in a working condition is miraculous, and to actually get to see one myself is an added bonus. My thanks go to Mike again for letting me test this out. And I wonder what else is still out there waiting to be found. Anyone got a Logotron sprite board? Or a graph pad? Or a basic air system? Or big ears? Or a bike drive 500? Or a Floyd 40? Or a challenge sprint? Or a Clive drive? Or a Voyager 7 modem? Or a Crescent disk drive system? Or a Data robot arm? Or a trick stick? From the early days of the Spectrum then, to a more modern era, as time moved on, we found ourselves in the early days of emulation, somewhere in the early 90s. There was a free-for-all on all titles, not much knowledge of how to go about things, and the general feeling of reliving your youth for free. As usual, where there is a desire, there are always companies stepping in to try and make money. You only have to look at the recent console re-releases to see it still happening. One way to make money, so several companies thought, would be to release CDs containing an emulator and a set of ROMs and game files. 
The games were all freely available on the internet anyway, but they were targeting the technically non-savvy users and users who didn't have the time or knowledge to get emulators working or download games. The Spectrum had several of these CDs, Specky Classics 97 and later 98 and Specky 3000 and probably a few more. There was also this one, Spectrum All-Stars. Originally released as two separate items, GameStation, a UK computer store, grabbed the product, added a third disc and packaged them all together in this exclusive in September 2008. To make this a bit more authentic, I had to hook up my partner's old laptop to install this on so that the hardware and software were the recommended specifications. The discs and package all look very professional for what is just an emulator and a small number of games. Disc 1 contains games like 3D Ant Attack, Blood Witch, Super Kid, Egghead 1 and 2 and Deathscape, along with a large number of Jonathan Coldwell games. When you install it, the emulator is simply called ZX Emulator V1. And the URL mentioned still works, but it just shows this. And it's been like that since 2017. In 2012, going back a bit further, it looked like this. And you have to go back to 2007 to get any idea of what the site was like. And Retrosoft, the company associated with this, seems to have vanished off the web in late 2006. But a few months prior to that, their site was boasting that they had signed up a lot of game authors to provide titles for these compilations. Back to the emulator, which according to the forum I found was written by a single man in Karachi somewhere, and not based on any similar products. Once launched we get a small window and list of games. To launch a game you have to double click it, which launches the emulator inside the window, and then you have to press the enter key to get the game to work. The emulator claims to have rights to use the Sinclair ROMs from Amstrad as well. No way to confirm this though. The window is small, and the only way to get it any larger is to switch to full screen. However, the performance drops and games do run slower. This also makes the sound terrible and makes games stutter sometimes. And the machine I'm using is a 2.8 GHz Intel Celeron laptop, a decent machine back then. Mooncrester should definitely be faster than this. The emulator, apart from the full screen problems, is pretty good I suppose for the games supplied, but there are some sound issues. Looking on the files on the disc though, and there seems to be unused things. There's a maps folder containing maps of the games, but no way to view them via the installed emulator. In the emulator folder itself on the computer, there are also some graphics files that aren't used. For example, an Alphacom 32 printer logo. I wondered if you could add your own games to this. So I created a bitmap and renamed it the same as the tap file and copied it across. Ran the emulator and no. Obviously, they've put some restrictions on this, so it only plays the games supplied. This too contains games like School Days, Wheelie, Phoenix, Back to School, Everyone's a Wally, Game Over, Combat Zone and more. When you install it, it creates a completely separate install, in a different folder. So if you want to play the first set of games you have to load one thing, and if you want to play the second set of games you've got to load V2 of the emulator, which is very annoying. And to make things worse, some of the games on disc 2 don't even work. Disc 3, which is still sealed, so let's open this then. The disc contains games like Aqua Squad, Egghead 3, Fun Park, Mega Blast, again a lot of things by Jonathan Caldwell. Popping the disc in and nothing happens, it doesn't auto-install. 
and the disk just contains a few games and a standalone emulator. Installing this, and it seems that all the restrictions have been lifted, and you can load any game you want. So I quickly loaded Antiquity Jones. And although it played okay, there were still sound problems. This emulator also allowed different zoom levels to the screen, as well as a full screen option, which was much better. As a purchase, I would have expected more for my cash. The forums from 2006 claim each disc would sell for around 4 99 but I still can't find a reference for sales on the internet, apart from a few second-hand ones on Amazon. Even paying 4 99 for just 20 games was madness in my opinion, if you had the knowledge yourself. The games took up a very small percentage of the space on the CD too, so again I guess they were milking this for all they could. Only the third disc with the unrestricted emulator would have been useful, as each person has their own favourite games, and limiting the emulator was obviously a ploy to get you to buy the next one. An interesting time in emulation history, and one soon to be cut short by copyright claims and interventions by companies wanting to protect their own property. Does owning this CD give me the legal rights to play these games now then? That's an interesting question, and I suppose it depends on the contracts entered into by the authors. I don't think I'll be keeping this set of emulators though on this machine, there are far better emulators out there, and many more games to be had. Even back then, for that matter, you could get Specky Classics and have 3,000 games and an emulator for a few pounds more. So, back on the shelf then. Moving on, and recently a viewer of the show sent me these. They may be familiar to some people, as there were several similar items around in the 80s for the Spectrum. They're screen planners. These though are new, and the creator is thinking about producing them to sell. They're used to, obviously, plan screens and sprites. And for the graphic artist, they can be invaluable. Each page has a grid matching the pixels on screen, giving you a good idea of attribute limits and sizes. If you're really artistic, you could even colour things in and make sure you're sticking to the two colour per block rule. At the side of the pages, is a smaller separate set of grids to allow for sprite design. Again, a really useful feature for designers working on new ideas. You could use this to design backgrounds that you can then split into 8x8 blocks for something like Arcade Games Designer. That program only shows you one block at a time, so being able to build up the scenery on paper and then copy it to screen would have made level design much easier. The quality is excellent too, and these are really very well produced. Should I find time to write a new game, I will definitely use these to help me with block, screen and sprite design. It's nice to see some old ideas coming back to the spectrum. Being around when the spectrum was first released, for me was a brilliant time. There were plenty of magazines to read, plenty of new games coming out, plenty of type-ins to keep me occupied, and plenty of friends to chat with about playing tips and new hardware. As the Spectrum was nearing the end of its commercial life though, many people, including myself, jumped ship and moved to the newer 16-bit machines. The Spectrum kept on though, even though the magazines gradually became thinner and thinner. So much so that the final issue of Your Sinclair didn't have a single game review or preview in it. It did, however, have this, the reader's top 100 games of all time. So at number 10 we've got 3D Death Chase from Micromega, this 16K game was released 10 years before this list was even created, in 1983, but definitely deserves to be on the top 10. The fast action and addictive gameplay made this a classic, that is still one of the all-time favourites. At number 9 is Robocop from Ocean Software, released in 1988. A game that spent ages in the top 10 charts when it came out. And catching in on the movie, the game is technically very good. It looks and sounds superb, and was one of the show-off titles for the 1 to 8K machines at the time. At number 8 it's Back to School from Microsphere, released in 1985. To be honest, I never got this game. I liked the graphics and the humour, but for some reason I just couldn't play it, or have the inclination to learn how to play it.
I know many people love this game, and for good reason, but it just didn't strike a chord with me, very much like the next game. At number 7 is Elite from Firebird, released in 1985. Again, a lot of people love this, very engrossing and hugely playable, if you like that sort of thing. The Spectrum always struggled with wireframe graphics, and the massive game had me reaching for something simpler. Something like, at number 6, Manic Miner from Bugbyte Software and later Software Projects, released in 1983. This Matthew Smith classic is just that, a classic. It broke the mould, gave us madcap sprites, great level design and huge playability. Platform games were never the same after this. At number 5 was Chaos from Games Workshop, released in 1985. Now, sorry, I don't get this game at all. Jeff tried to convince me otherwise, but it just doesn't appeal to me. A huge amount of players loved it, but for me it was slow and dull. Sorry people. I may have looked at it more favourably than I had someone to play against, but all of my friends were into shoot em ups. At number 4 is Sim City, released by Infograms in 1990. A newer game here, and one that managed to squeeze so much into the little spectrum. City management games didn't really appeal to me until much later on, and also by this time I'd left the spectrum, but nevertheless it was a wondrous achievement. At number 3, R-Type, released by Electronic Dreams in 1988. Ah, an absolute brilliant and very hard shooter. This is probably one of the best arcade conversions for the machine, and shows just what it can do. Great graphics and sound, and tough as hell gameplay. A shoot 'em up lover's dream come true. At number 2 is Rainbow Islands from Ocean Software, released in 1990. A platform game that I couldn't get into, or at least couldn't get the hang of. The game was released after I had moved on as well, but even the Amiga version was troublesome for me. Playing the Spectrum version now didn't improve my idea of the game. Too much to think about, I'm afraid. But if it got to number 2, I must be in the minority there. And finally number 1, Chase HQ from Ocean Software, released in 1989. Another great arcade conversion. Smooth graphics, great sound on 1 to 8k machines, and classic gameplay. And that was the top 10, but come on, where are the others? The games that appear on my and other top 10 lists, and the firm favourites. What about 3D Ant Attack? That only manages number 30. 30! That was a groundbreaking game. So clever for its time. Even Jet Set Willy only managed number 33. Jeff won't be happy about that. Attic Attack from Ultimate Play the Game at number 43. Amazing. Another game that break the mould and set the standard. The Hobbit, surprisingly, at number 68. And that was released in 1982. Jetpack, finally my favourite game, but at number 73? 73, really? It should be at least in the top 10. Horace goes skiing at number 83. Horace goes skiing in the top 100. Beating games like Trashman and Where Time Stood Still. What has the world come to? Has he gone mad? Timegate and Cyclone are missing from the list and Maziacs, but at least Fred gets in at number 82. Agree with it or not, that was the top games as voted for by readers of Your Sinclair magazine in September 1993. Now I'm just going to go and have a game of Jetpack. Now there's a good idea. Well, it was inevitable, wasn't it? This is Jetpack, released by Ultimate Play the Game in 1983. It was also released on the ill-fated ROM format, and, in my opinion, was the best game of the bunch. The story goes like this. The Acme Interstellar Transport Company is delivering spaceship kits to various planets in the solar system. And as the chief test pilot, all you have to do is assemble the rockets and thrust on to your next destination. 
as you don't often get a chance of a free trip across the galaxy, this is a great opportunity to get rich. Stop off on several planets on your journey, collect the odd sack of precious gems, elements or gold and take them back with you. So the object of the game is to build your spaceship, add fuel to it and then get off the planet, whilst at the same time shooting aliens and collecting valuable things. On the first and every subsequent fourth planet, a new spaceship will arrive, up to the fourth one, and then it repeats. So to complete this game, you have to build all four ships and complete all four levels per planet. So that's 16 different levels. The aliens loop every eight screens as well, or every second ship. The level layout for each section is exactly the same, and only the aliens change. On the first level, we just get meteors moving from left or right. Not too much trouble really, unless you get a fuel pod that drops near the edge of the screen. Level 2, and we get bouncing aliens. These just bounce around randomly, and these can be a bit tricky too. Level 3 are bouncing aliens, but these change direction without bumping into things. Very unnerving at times. Level 4 are just horizontal homing aliens, and these just head straight towards you. A new ship and level 5 arrives together, and here we get homing aliens heading straight for our hero, and these are the trickiest of all. Level 6 are the bouncing aliens again. On level 7 we get spaceships that move just like meteors. And level 8 are homing aliens again, very tricky. And then a new ship arrives, and we're back to the meteors again. The horizontal homing aliens first seen on level 4 have a slight bug. Sitting here on the middle platform means you can go and have a brew and not be killed. The aliens do change per level and planet as mentioned before due to memory restrictions because this is a 16k game. Their animation is a bit limited too. The game blew the competition out of the water at the time. The sheer quality of gameplay, graphics and sound were far beyond anything else that was going on in the industry at that point. Jetman can fly about with ease and even hover, although I never used that option. There are bonus items to collect for points and random drop points for fuel pods. The screen also wraps so you can fly off the left hand side and appear on the right, and this is good for getting away from those tricky aliens. This is just a brilliant game easy to play and difficult to beat. And talking of which, it wasn't until 2016 at Replay Manchester on a real spectrum that I completed it for the first time. What a fantastic moment that was. For fans of the game, there's also a modified version that adds different platform layouts, but this makes it a 48K game only, but definitely worth a look if you like the original. The game was also converted to other various systems like the BBC and the VIC-20. I don't think either version was better than the original, although the VIC-20 does have some nice sound effects. It also made an appearance on the Nintendo 64 game Donkey Kong 64 with an added collectible coin.
and there was the official reboot, called Jetpack Refueled on the Xbox 360. The original on the Spectrum, though, is the one I always come back to, as viewers will well know. A truly great game, and one that defines the Spectrum for me. Well, that was the end of this series. I'll be back with another whole 10 episodes shortly. Thanks for watching. Thank you.